Well, hi there. I'm Noah Bradley. This is Handmade House TV. And on this week's episode, I'm going to give you an update on the progress of the lake house. So stay tuned. Well, all right, once again, thanks for tuning in here to Handmade House TV. If you've been following along, you know that I'm gearing up to, to build my next home at, on a little lake uh, here in central Virginia. And I've been giving you updates and progress uh, as it's gone along as far as uh, uh, getting the building permit and working on the blueprints, uh, getting the site ready and talking to subcontractors about doing the foundation there. And I've shared with you that um, that the uh, footers uh, and the block work is scheduled to begin sometime after the 4th of July. Uh, and that's always kind of a vague thing when somebody tells you <laughs> after the 4th of July, because on the other side of 4th of July is infinity. Uh, it, it could be uh, never happened, but, uh, but uh, I, I trust this guy that's going to do the, the work for me. He's a really good fella. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you those uh, action videos after the 4th of July. Uh, but with a realistic expectation that it could be the end of July before he actually gets in there and does, does the work. So what does a person do when, when they are uh, getting ready to gear up, that they put so much effort into thinking things through? They've saved photographs of, of bathrooms that they enjoy, of, of uh, kitchen, kitchen cabinetry or whatever else. Uh, they've, they've spent a lot of time creating their own uh, blueprints or they've been working with an architect. They get it. They go through all the hurdles of getting the building permit and then suddenly you're put on a wait list. Uh, what, what, do you, what should you be doing in this time period? What, what things can you be thinking about that, that uh, will, you can knock out some things to make the project go better? And throughout the process of building a home, uh, whether you hire a builder or, or not, there's, there are decisions to be made throughout the entire construction of the home, uh, especially if it's a custom home. You know, you're going to have to be asked what kind of flooring you want in it, what kind of uh, paint on the walls do you want, what kind of hardware do you want on the, on, for the, the faucets and everything else in the house. Uh, there's there's a lot of decisions to be made, but it's and a lot of people are have moved forward with apprehension that there's so many there's going to be so many decisions that I need to make. I'm not going to be able to handle it, and it's going to be so stressful. That but that's not the case, uh, and that that is that you should always be working throughout the process on on something, on one thing at a time. Two times if you're a multitasker, you can take care of that. So right now, while there's a pause, should I just be sitting here and twiddling my thumbs and doing nothing? Absolutely not. Because there are, there are things that you need to think about and make preparation of and, and, and make it happen. And I've, I've created a little list of things here. Um, for one thing, if you're building a, a crawl space, uh, you're, you're going to need a crawl space door there. And so it wouldn't be uh, a bad idea to be looking into the construction of a crawl space door or uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of perhaps buying one out there. And I've made my share of access doors before, but I've never built a foundation uh, that is an insulated closed system uh, foundation. And we'll get more into that in the future. So the door needs to be an insulated door. And it'd probably be a good idea for me to talk to the block guys and ask them what the ideal size of it would be as far as working with their uniform block work. Uh, and perhaps I can have it installed at the same time the guys are doing the block work and then it's it's done it's set in it's it's permanently in place and I've got that got that finished so I'm I'm working on talking to the block guys about that uh, tool preparation you can think about the tools you're going to need ahead of time and uh, make sure that you have them and you have them ready to go that uh, the, your your blades on your saws are sharp and your chisels are sharp and your tool belt still fits and uh, you got enough batteries for your tools and anything that you might need uh, is, is ready and set and organized and ready to go for construction. Uh, another thing is to make sure and get some electricity, some power on site there, uh, that if you're starting with a raw piece of land, there is no electricity there. And the standard way this works, and I don't know, maybe things have changed since the last time I built, don't know, you know, COVID has all, made all kinds of impacts into the construction world, but typically a power company will not talk to you about putting power on your property until you have a foundation in place that they want to see some kind of permanence that a structure is going to be there. 
Uh, maybe that's changed now and you, all you need is a permit in place. But the, the under, from my understanding of it is the power company is very nervous about going through all the expense of putting all those power lines into a raw piece of land and then no house happens. And so they're out all of that expense and, uh, of doing all that in time and uh, we'll never get a return on it or perhaps the owner will sell it 10 years later and having never used electricity and the new people that buy it want a house in a different location and so all that work is a waste. So, uh, but none, and the problem with that is that once you get your foundation finished, you are ready for electricity. You're gonna do all that carpentry, all that lumber needs to be cut, all that uh, compressors need to run for the air guns. And, uh, and uh, so the electricity is really a wonderful thing to happen. So typically you have to have a generator, you run off a generator to construct a home and generators are awful things. Uh, they're, they're awful, they're loud, they make so much noise, they're non-stop going on on a job site. Your neighbors don't like you, the crew is burnt out from running it, and it never fails that by the time you finish framing the house, that's when the electric company shows up to put power in. So the general rule is, is that you want to get your power in there as quickly as possible. You want to get on that list so that maybe this works out that you can get power in there and you don't have to deal with the generator issue. But you need to talk to the power company and then you find out the reality of what's going on and then you're faced with the issue of a generator and it typically uh, one of these little homeowner generators is not big enough to really power construction of a, of a home it, it might be okay you can you can definitely work your skill saw with it you can cut lumber with it uh, but typically uh, something like an air compressor or a table saw on the job site, or two people working a saw at the same time uh, will typically blow the breaker on a generator. And so you need a pretty big one, and they're actually fairly expensive. I've got an old one that's, that's so ugly looking that I don't think anybody would steal it if they had the option to do it, uh, but it has been fairly dependable, and I think I can get one more job site out, one more construction out of it. If you're a homeowner and you're interested in building just this one house and you're done, uh, you certainly don't want to go out and buy a big generator for it. Uh, uh, if you've got a little one or you got access to a little one, you can probably make do. Or if uh, worst case scenario is you can go to a local uh, tool rip rental equipment company and rent a generator uh, for a month and you can probably knock it out. So other things you can be looking at uh, is that whether or not you want to use any rough sawn lumber on your house. And I'm still contemplating whether or not I want to use rough sawn for some of the uh, siding that's on the house and also the, uh, perhaps the porch decking. Uh, if you've watched another video of mine here, uh, recently I gave a tour of the house and uh, we had put down a uh, oak flooring that I bought at a sawmill and uh, it's still good. Uh, a couple of decades later, it's still still fine. It's it looks almost it looks better than new. It's got a little bit of age and a little bit of patina on it. Uh, but oak oak uh, so white oak holds up really well. It's extremely cheap to buy at a sawmill, and uh, if you wanted a painted porch floor or or, or a deck floor, you could you could go ahead and paint it as well. And by the way, oak doesn't hold up as well on a deck as it does on a porch. There's there's nice to have a, a covered surface underneath an oak floor. Um, but, uh, the, so it, so it's definitely cheaper, but what the reason why you want to go ahead and think about that and resolve it, go ahead and order it, go ahead and get it, uh, is that you want it to be, you want it to dry out some, you don't want it fresh green from a sawmill. Um, but, uh, you, uh, you know, so you want it to a little, to be able to season a little bit of dry a little bit. And if you don't, you'll put it down and you'll have so many gaps between the flooring that, uh, you'll be able to, you know, drop drop a soda between it, kind of thing, in which you definitely don't want. So it's it's a if you want to go with it, you'll save yourself like seventy five percent less than what any other flooring would be, maybe ninety percent less. Um, and same thing goes with siding; it does perfectly fine. And from everything I've understand, the code restrictions don't care about porch flooring nor siding, uh, what you might use, and it's very attractive. It's very durable. It's very affordable. And, um, and you want to you get it, you want to bring it to your lot, and you want to make sure and stack it with a layer of stickers between each layer. Uh, that's just any kind of rough lumber, just a little bit in there in order to provide a gap between each layer of flooring so that it can dry out in the middle of it and it won't all mold and stay wet and nasty. 
Um, and so another another issue is uh, is waterproofing of the foundation. You need to think about waterproofing of the foundation uh, and the drain lines that go around it. Uh, typically, in the past, I've always used a, a company that comes in and they they uh, they do this for a living. Um, and uh, they have the, all the equipment to spray on a product that that's uh, guaranteed for a minimum of 30 years. Uh, so it's it's a it's wonderful stuff. Uh, and uh, but it's a little bit expensive. And so I'm going to think about you know doing the typical go to Lowe's, get a bucket of stuff, and with a mop, uh, sl slather it on the outside uh, foundation, and take care of doing the drain lines myself to save some money. Um, uh, another thing is uh, the idea of, uh, I'm going to plan on using uh, on the house uh, probably uh, a propane furnace in addition to backup uh, air, air coils in order to provide air conditioning. I really like that uh, being able to hit the flick a switch, you hear a little bit of a roar, flame goes on, and you go over and stand next to the ductwork and there's heat coming, I mean really heat coming out of the vent. Uh, whereas uh, uh, typically with a heat pump system, um, it uh, a little bit of uh, the air that comes out is just a, a degree or two warmer than the room, so it'll warm up the room eventually. But it's not really a warming. You can't stand by the vent and really get, get warmed up and everything else. So because I'm doing that, I'm going to need a propane tank on the property. And I'll probably go with a backup generator as well. And uh, we like cooking with propane as well. So. Uh, if you have a propane uh, tank, you need to go ahead and talk to your heating air condition, uh, the propane suppliers, and uh, they will size a tank that, that will supply all your needs and supply it to you, but it's up to you to bury it. And so if you have the tank on site when, you ha when the time comes to install the septic tank, while the guy's there installing the septic tank, he can go over and install the propane tank as well. So go ahead and get your propane tank and order it. It generally takes a few weeks to get it. And you don't want that to be a problem or a double trip, a double expense when the time comes. Uh, on this particular site that I'm working on, uh, also in addition to having the power lines brought in, you also want to call up the, uh, the telephone uh, service in order to get a hard line run in. And typically these two people work together. Uh, so that when the trench is dug uh, by generally by the power company that they will go ahead and they worked out a deal that they'll put the, the telephone line basically in the same trench run run to the house and uh, I wish we were at that stage of having fiber optic lines run but that's not it which brings me to my next thing and that is chances are in order to get propane on this rural site for the next couple of years uh, we're going to need Starlink uh, uh, satellite system, and so it's a good idea to call and see whether or not there's much of a waiting list on it, and if there is, to go ahead and get on it so when you move into the house, you're, you're internet ready. Uh, another, another thing to consider is that when you, when you have your foundation open uh, and the crawl space is finished before you, uh, af after you waterproof the foundation, before you backfill the dirt around it, it's very important to remember to apply your, your termite spray to the house. Uh, and that, that's typically just sprayed around the foundation of the house uh, at this time. And if you forget about it, if you don't think, if you don't remember it, and you go ahead and backfill against your house, the only way to effectively and not nearly as good as uh, uh, apply a termite spray around your house is basically the termite company has to go around like every foot or every two feet and drill a hole into the soil and then go in and spray the stuff heavily down into the hole and hope that it dissipates through the dirt enough to, to keep the termites away. Uh, obviously that's going to cost you a whole lot more to do that and it's not as good of a job and it's all because you didn't think or you didn't remember to do that. Fortunately throughout my career I've always remembered to do that and appreciative of it. Uh, I'm hoping that, and I'm going to talk with, but uh, sometimes uh, banks insist upon seeing verification uh, when they give out a loan that the house has been termite sprayed. I'm wondering whether or not that rule might have changed uh, as of yet. I don't think the county, uh, the building inspectors require termite sprays at all. It's wise to do. You don't want termites eating up your house. Uh, generally, one application will last you a long, long time. Um, and uh, But uh, I have had great success in using uh, these products myself. It's not that I really love working with poisons. But I figure a one quick shot, and uh, and I can I can do my own uh, in, in my own termite inspection and save myself 
hundreds of dollars uh, that the products are available. All you gotta do is do a Google search for do-it-yourself uh, pest treatment uh, control. And there's, there's several good companies out there that I've used and had great success with all of them. Uh, and then uh, when, we're, when we're building the foundation of the house, it's important to keep in mind the lines that come into the house. Uh, in particularly, uh, most importantly, uh, is the septic drain lines. And that's because it's a big, big, huge pipe uh, that goes in. And typically, it goes in underneath the footers and or, uh, or through the footers. And uh, uh, typically, it has to go in exactly the right place where... Uh, where it will lead out to the septic tank. And so it's not a bad idea to make sure and have a section of that pipe handy uh, when, uh, when it comes time to build the foot, when the foundation guys get in line and also to know where that pipe goes and they'll gladly set it in place. It makes the work of the, uh, of the uh, septic guys so much easier than having to dig under your house and then go in your crawl space and dig out in there in order to get a line through. And the, the only other lines that really come into your house are water supply lines, uh, which from what I've always seen is that the guys uh, really don't like to exact it. They just dig over to the house and then they just pull out a drill and just drill through the block because a water supply line's not, not all that big. Um, so, so mainly keep, keep that in mind. Um, uh, and then uh, job site security. Uh, you want to really, really think through this. I've, fortunately, in most of the locations I've built, I've never had a problem uh, other than one location. And I lost uh, tens of thousands of dollars worth, I shouldn't say tens of thousands, over $10,000 worth, uh, maybe as much as $20,000 worth of materials were, were ripped off on the one site. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a hard blow to deal with. And uh, the culprit was never found. I have great suspicion that it was one of my crew members who did it, uh, came by at, at nighttime and did it, but uh, I don't have any proof. And so there is judgment one day for whoever did that stealing, but uh, you wanna watch yourself. Uh, during the construction phase that, that thievery does happen, make sure and put up a, a no trespassing sign that no one is allowed on your property. You don't, even neighbors love to be tourists. They love to come by. If they get injured, they're gonna sue you. Uh, you don't know whether or not they're, uh, they're up to good or up to no good or whatever. Chances are your neighbors are fine. They're wonderful. My neighbors are, uh, but still, I, I really don't want them poking around on a job site, risking being hurt or talking to a crew and slowing it down for a half hour uh, while they share what's, what's really going on in the job site. So a good sign at the end, uh, it's a really good idea to put a chain across your driveway to prevent people from coming in with vehicles. Uh, if they have to park their vehicle at the road and walk in, they're clearly not going to walk away with uh, a hundred pound roll of copper in, in doing a, such a thing. Uh, and also, it's a, it's a wonderful idea to have at least one good job site camera on there to record the license plate of every vehicle coming in and leaving. It's not a bad idea to keep one up there uh, focused on the, on the house itself to just to make sure that no one's been poking around. And, uh, and uh, so make, it's, it's, it costs you a little bit, but in the end, if you're ripped off, uh, the cameras might prevent you from being the victim of, of theft. Uh, but if you are, you will so value the being able to get that material back and see to it that the person who did you wrong is prosecuted. Um, and then uh, uh, don't forget about uh, uh, a porta john uh, uh, the those little portable bathroom units there. Uh, that uh, some areas require by code to have one like that. Uh, when you have people working there, they expect to have a little bathroom facility and not go into the woods uh, to do their business. So uh, it is an expense, uh, about a hundred bucks a month from the last time I, I did. They come out weekly and they, they pump them. Uh, it is kind of a bummer uh, that, um, that uh, the, a lot of times they sit there and uh, don't don't get a whole lot of use, uh, but nonetheless, it's important to have one. It's part of the expense of building a home these days. Uh, if you are building uh, an outhouse, I, which I doubt it, I doubt if you are, but a couple of the remote log cabins I built, uh, we actually built the outhouse early on in the construction of the house, and that was what we were able to use uh, throughout the construction of the of the home. 
um, and, and save the expensive. And, and I think we worked it out technically and it was like uh, it paid for itself to build the outhouse that uh, and, and savings of uh, paying uh, rental fees on a portage on. And uh, let's see, um, internet and how to make phones. And that, that appears to be all that I got here. That's actually, that's actually right much. So see, there's, there's always something for you to do, always something for you to be thinking about and working on. And, um, and that, so that's my to-do list. If you guys don't hear from me in a week or two or whatever else, or you're wondering why the house isn't moving along, I'm doing these things, which aren't very exciting. Uh, me, me calling up uh, and talking to uh, someone is not the most exciting video for you guys to watch. Um, anyway, I, anyway I, I thank you so much. And when you're building a house, this is actually all very critical information, and I think you should put it to use when that time comes. So we'll see you again here next week on Handmade House TV. And until then, you take care. Bye now.